what is geography? We can start with a quote from a famous travel book by Paul Thoreau. Paul Thoreau is one of the pioneers of modern travel writing, and he liked to travel places over the ground. So in this book, the old Patagonian Express, which is the name of a train that you see in the picture, he went all the way from Boston all the way to the end of South America without ever getting on a plane or on a boat, all on taxis and buses and walking and horses and trains and stuff like that. So the book is called The Old Patagonian Express, the same as the name of the train there. And the quote is, South America was a problem in geography. It could only be understood if one kept moving. To stay put was to be baffled. And so a problem in geography, what made it that you had to keep moving in order to not be baffled? And that says a lot about geography because geography is about space. It's about places in space. It's about seeing the world in terms of regions, places in space. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to move across space in order to be able to see the big picture. And you could move in the real world or you could move on a map. You can look at a map and move across the map and you get the spatial perspective on the world. So that's what geography at its essence is about. It's a spatial way of looking at what happens on the surface of the world, the environment around us. The word itself, geography, comes from the ancient Greek word geographia, which literally means geo is the earth, and then graph is to draw or write something. So it's literally to draw or describe and write the earth. And it's first used by a Greek named Eratosthenes, who was a scientist and mathematician and geographer. And he lived uh, just after the time of uh, Plato and Aristotle and those other guys from the Greek golden age. So if you think about it, when we make a map, we are literally drawing the earth. And so if we make our mental maps and we think about the earth's surface, we're also doing geography. We're sort of drawing the earth in our minds, making models of the earth's surface and what goes on there in our minds. But for an official definition of geography, we can go to the Oxford Dictionary which says that geography is the study of the physical features of the earth and its atmosphere and of human activity as it affects and is affected by these, including the distribution of populations and resources, land use, and industries. So there are several key words that I want to focus on in this definition, the word distribution. And I have it below there, the definition. Geography, distribution is a very important concept. How something is distributed across the earth's surface. Think about it like jacks, you know, or, or you throw down the game of jacks, you throw down um, all the jacks, and every time you throw them down, they come in a different pattern, right? They're never always the same. So what that is, is a different distribution. It's a different distribution of jacks across the surface of the floor. It's the same thing here. Look at this picture of Bavaria in Germany, and it's showing us a distribution of lots of things, of houses and roads and trees and mountains. And there's a reason behind that. There's some reason for that distribution that we see in that picture. And of populations, do we see the picture? We do, right? Resources, land use, and industries all going on on the surface of the earth. The other key thing is that in this definition, geography is about the physical features of the earth and its atmosphere. So it's, it's what happens on the surface of the earth. Geographers are concerned with like astronomy to an extent but mostly to figure out what's going on on the surface of the earth. In other words, we need to know about earth and sun relations, but so that we can figure out how the sun hits the earth and creates climates and weather on earth. We need to know also about like magma cycles deep inside the earth. But again, that's mostly so we can figure out things like plate tectonics, earthquakes and plate boundaries and all that stuff. Right here, I wanna pause and dispel some myths about geography and also history at the same time. You probably have heard people say, or maybe you said yourself, oh man, I don't like history. It's just a bunch of dates, just a bunch of memorizing dates. Or geography is just memorizing where things are. That's all it is, right? What the capitals are and what the names of the countries are and where they're on the map. But that's actually not true. That's not what history is. And that's not what geography is. So if people thought that they didn't like the subjects because of that, they were not actually talking about the subjects. So what are geography and history? How do they differ from those things? Well, geography and history are 
twins, sort of. They're two sides of the same coin, yin and yang. One looks at the world in terms of space, geography, and one looks at the world in terms of time, which is history. So geography studies places within space, space being the continuum. And then uh, history looks at events within the continuum of time. Okay, so space and time. You think about it, everything that happens happens in space and time, right? You can't have something happen just in space, but not time, or vice versa. So working backwards from that, what if we just recorded where things are? Well, then we'd be doing cartography. That's map making. You're mapping things, putting them putting in their right place on the surface. But it's when we add the questions of why and so what? Why is it where it is? And what does that matter? What's more important? Which patterns on the surface of the earth on the map are more important? And how they all connect together, things like that. Then we're doing geography. Then we're really studying the places in space, not just what's where, memorizing locations. The same thing is during history, right? People say, oh, it's just a bunch of dates. But no, that's just chronology or chronicle. You're just chronicling what happened. But history is when you say, why did that happen? And so what? How does it all fit together? So geography and history, two subjects that are two sides of the same coin, time and space. So let's look at three main approaches to geography. And I'm about to introduce you to some famous geographers. Uh, you could call these schools of thought, you could call these sort of subfields, but really it's just, I call them approaches, right? They're ways of approaching geography because they all overlap. They're not really fully distinct. Everything in geography connects to each other. One approach is to look at the world in terms of its natural features, which are called landforms, lakes, glaciers, mountains. And that's called physical geography. Another approach is to look at the world in terms of what humans do, the humans themselves, where they are, the populations, but then also the stuff that humans build, like cities and highways and high-speed rail, and then all the networks that humans uh, construct of trade and their patterns of transportation and foodways and all these types of things. That's called cultural geography, also known as human geography. So if you take AP geography class in high school, that will be AP human geography, specifically about that. Then those two, physical and cultural, are called thematic approaches because there's a physical theme and a cultural or human theme. But the other approach to geography is called regional geography, where instead of a theme, you just look at regions of the world. Okay, where are the different regions of the world? How can you delimit different boundaries around the world? What, what makes a place a specific region? That's almost like an infinite amount of possibilities there. So those are three main approaches to geography. Now let's look at some famous geographers from each of these different schools, keeping in mind that really they all overlap. No one's just a regional or cultural or physical geographer. So in terms of physical geographers, there are so many, but here's a few. One is named Alfred Wegener, Alfred Wegener, who was a German from the early 1900s. And he is the pioneer who invented the theory of continental drift. He said, it looks to me like these continents are sliding apart from each other over time. They used to be together, and we called, uh, actually he didn't call it, but somebody else did, Pangea, okay, a single supercontinent, and then they spread apart. So he deduced that um, from his studies and also from actually going out into Greenland and studying uh, ice sheets and things like that. And later that theory was partly true and partly false, and it developed though into plate tectonics. So he's an early forerunner or pioneer who helped lead to the theory of plate tectonics, which is a major break breakthrough in science. On the right, you have a much more modern physical geographer and a truly amazing lady, if you look her up on the internet. Her name is Dawn Wright. She goes by the name of Deep Sea Dawn. And her resume is so long, it's like Santa Claus's list. It's like very, very long. And this is a woman who goes out uh, into the, for example, the Pacific Ocean, in submersibles down underneath the ocean, goes to the ocean floor and maps the ocean floor. And she's been doing this for decades. She's also extremely um, skilled in geographic information systems. Okay, so uh, she works at Oregon um, State University, very, very um, accomplished physical geographer named Deep Sea Dawn Wright. What about human geographers? Again, there are lots, but here's a few of the pioneers. One is named Carl Sauer. He's sometimes said to be the father of modern human geography. He looked at the world as a set of landscapes, landscapes around us, almost like compositions in a painting. You know, So uh, a quote from him is, culture is the agent, 
the natural area is the medium and the cultural landscape is the result. In other words, he's looking at the world as a piece of art almost that's created by humans using the medium, you know, instead of paint and pastels and brushes, we're using earth itself as the medium and we're sculpting it into a cultural landscape, which is partly human uh, created and partly created by nature. And that's sort of the magical thing about geography is one of the kind of the wondrous things about geography is that you get to look at the world and see how there's nature, but then there's humans who are part of nature and they mix and they create this new thing which takes on a life of its own. Then on the right side, actually a student of Carl Sauer, his name is Yi Fu Tuan. He got out of uh, Mao's China back in the uh, mid 20th century, came to the United States, ended up being a professor at the University of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin. So one of his quotes is, geography is a study of earth as the home of people. And that that's really a human geography perspective, putting humans at the center of what goes on on the surface of the earth. And we've looked at physical and human geographers. Let's take a look at regional geographers as well. Now, again, this is an arbitrary distinction because these, for example, Harm de Blige on the left has written physical geography books, cultural geography books, and regional geography books. Harm de Blige was a pioneer of geography in the United States. He was an immigrant from the Netherlands. And he had an amazing childhood where he grew up during World War II. And so for his formative years, right, about 10 years old, for about five years or so, he was living in an occupied city, occupied by the Nazis. And he was just in his house, you know, like on lockdown, going to school, coming back, you know, very scared, et cetera, hearing bombs and destruction. And he learned geography in school from a great teacher that he said that he had. And then at home, he would go back and follow the war by listening to the radio. And he would follow the battles and where they were. And he learned geography at the beginning through school, but also through war, right? Through through following the war through the radio. So, like I said, he migrated to the United States, became a professor at Michigan State, and he is uh, author of books, uh, longtime professor, teacher. But he was also on Good Morning America um, decades ago as like their geographer. So, harm de Blige. And on the right, finally, we have a French regional geographer named uh, Paul de Blache. Among other things, he's the pioneer of the theory called possibilism. And possibilism is a response to determinism. So environmental determinism is a theory that how a people are successful or not, a culture, a society, a country, whether or not they're successful is a function of their environment. Your environment determines your success. So places that have you know, better farmland and um, easier climates to live in, more water access would be better and more successful. Um, but de Blige countered that. He said, nah, it's not entirely true. It's more that, not environmental determinism, but possibilism, meaning the environment provides possibilities. And humans, though, can work with those possibilities in different ways. Okay, so some societies, for example, are mountainous and people and landlocked. People say, ah, that society will never be successful. You're, you're in the mountains and you're landlocked. What can you do? Well, yeah, it's true. There are some poor countries like that. Like, for example, Bolivia uh, is a poor mountainous country in South America. But uh, it's a beautiful country, though. I've been there. It's a beautiful, beautiful landscapes and uh, indigenous peoples, et cetera. But Austria is also, in Switzerland, are also landlocked mountainous countries. They're very, very rich countries. So uh, he gives, goes to show you that possibilism, that environment provides possibilities, and then you can work within those possibilities. It doesn't necessarily determine your success. So if that wasn't enough of an advertisement for geography, if those cultural, physical, and regional geographers weren't enough, um, I'll give you three more, more from everyday culture. People who majored in geography, Michael Jordan and Prince William, the future, uh, the Prince of Wales, the future King of England. They both majored in geography. Michael Jordan majored in geography at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Prince William at St. Andrews in Scotland. And then in the bottom, you see a saint, Mother Teresa, a woman who uh, was actually born in Albania during the Ottoman Empire in 1910. And then she migrated uh, later to India and she worked in the city of Calcutta helping people with leprosy. She is a saint. And... Um, she taught geography and like religious studies, catechism for 17 years. So 
Let's also dispel some myths about what geography is not. We said it's not just about memorizing place names. We know that. It's not just about mapping things because that's important to geography, just like timelines are important to history. But cartography or mapping is not essentially all of what geography is. Um, also important to realize that geography is not just a science. Geography uses science and it also uses social studies. But it's not just a science. If it was just a science, it would be called earth science or environmental science, but it's not. And that's because geography also looks at a lot of the human aspects and the humanities as well, and it ties them together. You can see that on this chart. It looks like a lot of mumbo jumbo, but if you look closely, all of it's saying in the middle is that the geography fields, all the little subfields within geography, from biogeography to urban geography to economic geography, are all drawing on the sciences on the left, like the physical sciences and natural sciences, astronomy, oceanography, zoology. And on the right, they also draw on social studies or social sciences, like anthropology, economics, uh, political science, all that stuff. In other words, geography pulls them together. I'll give you a simple example. Go to Paris, right? Go on vacation to downtown Paris. Go see the Cathedral of Notre Dame, like the Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's on a little tiny island, right? Little tiny island in the Seine River. Okay, so you go to that cathedral, you're looking at the cathedral, it's beautiful. That's social studies, right? That's art history, architectural history, all the history of France. Turn around the other way, there's a river there. Okay, so that's geography, right? So it's using both. There's a geography of architecture, there's a geography of art, there's a geography of religion. You know, that's a Catholic cathedral. But then there's a geography of the rivers itself, right? Fluvial geography, hydrogeography. So all these, the cool thing about geography, what makes it so cool is that you can do it together. You can say, how come this cathedral was built on this island in that river? And how did that river affect this cathedral? I bet you they brought the, the stones across, you know, they must have brought those big stones in on that river on boats. Right, and all the other workers must have come in on the boats too. And you can think about how they all connect. Okay, so the cool thing about geography is you can use all of it the sciences and the social sciences, bring it all together and use it all. And the last thing that geography is not, as we alluded to earlier, is that it's not just about where things are, not just you know, memorizing the locations, but why. Okay, now on these uh National Geographic uh, geography bees, which you see at the bottom, they do really emphasize the memorization aspect. And why is that? Well, because it's kids. It's usually like middle school kids doing it, elementary, middle school. That's an age when you kind of sponge up lots of information. There's nothing wrong with that. But as you get to the higher level of geography, you have to see more about regions and why things are connected. I'll give you an example. Um, I was driving home one time and somewhere in Providence, Rhode Island, I think there's a map store. I don't even know the name of it. You can look it up. And you don't see a map store very often. Right. So you got to be a special person to open a map store, especially in Providence for now. And I had to, I had to go in because I teach geography. So I'm looking around all these maps, talking to the owner. And, and he, we're talking about geography education. And he says, you know, yeah, people talk to me and they say, I know where this is on the map. And they memorize all these locations. But he said, that's not really, you know, I'm not impressed with that because you just know where stuff is. But do you know about it? He said, I'd be much more impressed. If they came to me with just one city, not all the cities that they memorized, but just one, but they could tell me the story of that city. Why was it founded? What happened? Right? How did it evolve over time spatially? Right? It grew from this to this. Well, how did it sort of uh, grow in symbiosis, so to speak, with the environment? What was the human environment interaction? How did they adapt to modify and depend on the environment as they made that city? That's a much more complex and sort of big view of what's happening on the Earth's surface. And that's really what geography is about. So you need to know where stuff is. I don't want to downplay memorization. You do actually have to memorize some stuff to know where stuff is in the world. But that's only part of it. The rest of it's more like in-depth knowing why. The key question is, what is where? Why? And so what? That's a question we can use uh, throughout the entire semester, entire course. What is where, why, and so what? This is a quote by Isaiah Bowman. And it's a great thing to just keep coming back to. 
if you you know trying to write something about geography, answer a question, think what is where, why, and so on. There's a lot in there. The first word is a question in itself. What? Like what are we looking at? Right? To understand patterns of volcanoes, you have to understand volcanoes. Like what is a volcano? How does it work? Okay, so you can see this picture here. And you could ask, what is where, why, and so what? Why are these wind farms in the patterns that they are? The distribution that you see and the farms, why are they situated that way? Especially with relation to the water next to them. So there's a pattern. Somebody thought of that. And that's what geography studies, the why and the so what, along with the where. So we take that question, what is where, why, and so what? And we can apply that to literally any part of the world. Let's go to South America. Let's check out Brazil. Okay, look at the map. Brazil is half of South America. It's half of the people. It's half of the territory. Why? Why is it half of South America? Why is it half of the people? Why is it half of the territory? How did it get like that? Because there was a time, right, before the 1500s, then nobody from Europe was in there. And now it's people from... Uh, all over Brazil have uh, European roots, African roots. That wasn't there before, right? All blended in with indigenous peoples and other parts of the world. How did that happen? Geography can tell you. Now we can just ask, what are geographers doing? If I major in geography, what can I do? Well, geography is a way of seeing the world. And it's a way of seeing the world in terms of places and space. So it's more, it's not just a skill. It's not a thing you point to and say, I can do that, that, that. Although there are skills within geography, like mapping and uh, geostatistics, you can do almost anything with geography. The CIA, for example, uh, they use geography all the time. Anybody in the military, there's lots of map reading involved, right? To know where stuff is. You have regional analysts who know about the Middle East, know about Latin America, Central Asia. Pretty much everything in environmental science is connected to geography and has a geography component. If you like humanities, there's geoarchaeologists. Urban geographers look at city patterns. It's a massive field, urban geography, transport systems, subways, public spaces, so many things in urban geography, mega cities, Tokyo, Mexico City, et cetera, medieval towns. You actually still have explorers. There's people who just still go to faraway places. They go to difficult to reach places like Antarctica. They're in that, in that picture there. And all of these things, too. If you're a tour guide outside, it's very much uh, uh, connected to geography. If you are working in shipping and logistics, if you're a geographic educator doing field work or field studies, uh, any kind of those outdoor education programs really helps for that. Um, D DTMs on the right, digital terrain models, where you're basically like a video game. You show what the earth looks like so you can think about it. And uh, this is an interesting case down here um, in Central America. They help make a, not a digital, but an actual model of the indigenous territory there that you see of that tribe. And that allowed them to then defend it in the political system. They could defend the encroaching farmlands and, and uh, people trying to take their land by making a model of it. So it's all geography and it basically helped to save their own homeland through geography. So you can take a look at this list and see if there's anything you know that, that you already do or are interested in that fits with that. But all these things are very much connected to geography. So the final question we could ask is, why is geographic education vital? Why is it so important, so essential? And one reason is because it's been so lacking in the United States in the last century or so, since the middle of the 20th century, we really need to make a comeback, you know, just to be uh, have global literacy. So one reason is because of we live in a global world. We have globalization and things are interconnected, right? Just look around the room that you're sitting in right now or wherever you might be, here's your clothes, and just look at everything and see where it's made. You could make a map of that. It might blow our, blow our minds, right? If we looked at a map and saw all the places where this, the stuff on our bodies is made. So to understand how to operate in business and in politics and understand the world around us, we have to know where things are and how they're connected. Also, we live in a multicultural society. Right? We have a multicultural society where people from all over the world are getting together and interacting. So we need to know something about where people are coming from. What is a society like where these people work, I'm working with or I'm going to school with are from? We also live in a dynamic world. Things are always changing. There are new territories popping up. You know, Europe has new countries. It was Yugoslavia when I was growing up, and now it's seven countries. Right, All like Eastern Europe, a lot of it used to be uh, Soviet satellite states under the USSR. 
now are independent countries. Okay, look at Ukraine war as I'm speaking right now. Russia's trying to invade. It's very geographic. Finally, geographic education is vital because it opens possibilities for our lives. So I'll give you an example. If I had a class um, in front of me, I often ask, okay, is anybody here interested in studying abroad, going for a semester abroad? You want to, you know, do art or do language or do science or whatever it is for a semester or a year in some other country during your education? Of course, everybody's hand goes up, right? And the question is, well, how are you going to do that if you don't know where anything is, right? If you, How are you going to choose where to go and figure out how to get there and whether you can do it or not if you don't know what's out there? Okay, so geography expands our mental map of the world. Let's just see big and see the world. And therefore, we can guide and sort of navigate our own ship better. We can know where to go, what the possibilities are, not just for education, study abroad, but also for jobs and travel and um, connecting with all kinds of uh, nonprofit groups and helping people in other sides of the world. We can do that much better when we understand what's out there. So that's a look at the question, what is geography? Geography is a great subject. It's one of the broadest subjects that there is. There's, no matter what you're interested in, there's some connection to geography. And like we said, it opens possibilities and helps you to explore the world.